that are really special for us. Uh, I, I, I know there's prosecutors and defenders um, and uh, members of the victims advocacy community and restorative justice practitioners and some representatives of a few politicos and a few other, uh, maybe some public officials here and I'm really glad that you're here and uh, consider it important that Vermont Law School do this. BLS, um, you probably know, is, is engaged with uh, the question of climate and, and sustainability, and we are also very engaged with the question of uh, justice, if you will, and um, re really social justice. And our, a lot of our, most of our students come here uh, to make a difference in the world. That's, that's why they come here. And our job is to give them the tools they need to change the status quo. And, and so it's really appropriate for us to have discussions, deep, important discussions that get right to the details of how to do that. And this is one of those moments. Um, we, we actually, um, the, one of the ways we engage with these key issues is through our centers and institutes, which are run by our faculty and our students and, and act in the real world. Um, and we have just, in fact, decided to create a center uh, devoted uh, to the reform of the system of criminal justice, uh, led by our professor, Robert, better known to many of you, Bobby Sand, who is, uh, in, and this is something that we consider really central to our mission. And in that regard, um, I, I see Gail Burford here in the audience. Uh, we've asked Gail Burford, who is uh, emeritus, I guess, professor from UVM uh, in social work to, to join us as a distinguished uh, a visiting uh, professor, visiting scholar. So. Thank you for agreeing. I think you agreed to do it. If not, <laughs> if not, will you do it? Yes. You have to put them on the spot. You have to choose your moments. 
So um, the, the discussion, the lecture, and the presentation that you're about to hear is, uh, and enjoy is part of our involvement in that. It's this, this, this talk is an annual talk, and it's named after Sterry Waterman. And Sterry Waterman uh, was, is the late senior judge uh, for the Second uh, Circuit Federal District, Federal Court of Appeal, and um, also uh, was a chair of the Vermont Law School Board of Trustees. So that's that's what this lecture is, and uh, it's great that Lee, good Mark, that you're here to to join us. And so Bobby, I pass the podium to you. Thank you. President Mahali asked me to come up to his office a while ago, and he said to me, we're looking for a smart, thoughtful, articulate, and provocative person to deliver the annual Waterman address, and I stood up and started to walk out, and he said, where are you going? And uh, we're having a conversation, and I said, oh, excuse me, but say no more. I'm going to see if Lee Goodmark is available. <laughs> So let me break this down a little bit. Smart, thoughtful, articulate, and provocative. So Professor Goodmark is a summa cum laude graduate from Yale University and a graduate with distinction from Stanford Law School. I know what you're thinking. It's not VLS, but it's pretty good. <laughs> thoughtful. So she is the founder and director of the Gender Violence Clinic at the University of Maryland. She uh, ran clinical programs at the University of Baltimore. She has been uh, voted the uh, faculty, the professor of the year on multiple occasions from different sources. She is the author of A Troubled Marriage, Domestic Violence and the Legal System, published in 2012 by NYU Press. Uh, at the risk of revealing my old eyes, let me just share a uh, one of many thoughtful paragraphs uh, from the book that will help frame uh, the talk to come. The battered women's movement has ceded control over the responses to domestic violence, enabling the state through the legal system to take primary responsibility for addressing domestic violence and to determine the objectives of that response. Developing that legal response to domestic violence has pro profoundly shaped domestic violence policy. Millions of dollars have been poured into police and prosecution, parole and probation, and legal services. Funding has also flowed to research on the effectiveness of these interventions, research which questions just how well this money has been spent. In a zero-sum world of dollars for responses to domestic violence, over-reliance on the legal system has stunted the development of other options. Thoughtful indeed. Articulate. Curious. How many of you have heard Lee Goodmark speak previously? Pretty, pretty good. Uh, any of you who heard her address the 2014 International Restorative Justice Conference at UVM would know how articulate she is. If you heard her speak in Halifax uh, this past summer, you would know how articulate she is. If you go on the web and hear her addresses in New Zealand and Australia, you would know how articulate she is. And shortly, you'll find out for yourself. To the students and to the all of you who are students of persuasion, watch what she does. I suspect that she will be persuade, persuasive, not by banging on the podium, but instead by meeting us where we are and taking us to a new place. And that's what persuasion is. And finally, provocative. You can turn on the TV at any point, but especially now, and find people who are provocative for the sport of being provocative. Other people are provocative because they have the courage, born out of experience, to raise new ideas that need to be discussed. Lee Goodmark is the courageous type of provocative. 
And it's very important to understand that this is not provocation born out of the academy, but instead emanates from years of working with women and families in crisis. This is provocation from the trenches, not the towers. It is a great honor for Vermont Law School and for me personally to present to you the 2016 Waterman Lecture delivered by Professor Lee Cookman. much. It's lovely, actually, to see so many friends in the room, um, even though I'm far away. Um, and I just kind of whispered to Bobby all day, he's been saying to me, are you nervous? Are you okay? And I've been fine all day until now. Um, I'm pretty sure I didn't deserve as many lovely things as Bobby just said, um, but I do hope that I'll be able to talk to you a little bit tonight about some ideas that might feel strange and um, possibly threatening in some way and help you to see how I got to that place. So thank you to Vermont Law School, thank you to Dean Mahali, and thank you to Bobby for inviting me to deliver this Dairy Waterman Lecture. Um, Judge Waterman, by all accounts, was a wonderful man, and I wish that I could have met him. I am so grateful to be giving a lecture in his honor. Um, tributes to Judge Waterman note his genuine concern for and engagement with others, as well as his directness and his willingness to let his views be known, but in an even-handed manner. Those are attributes that I greatly admire and that I try to emulate. Um, and, and so in giving what has been built pretty widely as a controversial talk tonight, um, I hope what you'll see is the genuine concern for my clients and for other people subjected to abuse that animates this work, um, as well as my desire to engage in a productive and respectful dialogue about some pretty difficult issues. And I want to give you just two quick caveats before I get started. Um, first, decriminalization is not the same as legalization. And there's a question mark at the end of the title of the talk. <laughs> so that being said, let's go ahead and dive in. In 1984, the United States Attorney General's Task Force on Family Violence called for strengthening the criminal legal response to domestic violence in the United States and said domestic violence is a criminal justice problem that requires a criminal justice solution. And just as recently as last year, uh, Pre uh, Vice President Joe Biden in the United States of Women stood up in front of a crowd of screaming Democratic women, I know I was there, and said essentially the same thing. Um, criminal laws that could have been used to address intimate partner violence existed prior to that time, and I know that some of you were there and you know this, but generally were ignored in the context of intimate relationships. That really changed beginning in the late 70s and certainly in 1984 when the uh, task force made this declaration and intensified in 1994 with the passage of the Violence Against Women Act. I think it's now fair to say that criminalization is the primary response to intimate partner violence in the United States. That commitment to criminalization might be justified if the criminal response was having an appreciable impact on rates of domestic violence. But there's reason to question whether that is, in fact, the case. Since 1994, rates of domestic violence in the United States have fallen dramatically. So has the overall crime rate. And between 1994 and 2000, rates of domestic violence fell just as much as the overall crime rate is falling. In 2010, rates of domestic violence fell less than the drop in the overall crime rate. And this was at a time when we were pouring, as Bobby said, hundreds of millions of dollars into specifically the criminal justice response to domestic violence. There is no reliable social science data that ties the drop in the rates of intimate partner violence to criminalization or to this increased funding and criminal legal system activity that was spurred by the Violence Against Women Act. So that should give us pause at least and get us to start asking some questions that I want to engage tonight. At the same time that the United States was ratcheting up its criminal response to domestic violence, rates of incarceration in the United States were skyrocketing. And while criminalization of domestic violence hasn't been the primary cause of that increase, the turn to the criminal law has certainly contributed 
to the phenomenon of mass incarceration. Jim did my homework for me this weekend, um, which was very kind of you. And as Jim Kenyon noted in his column on Sunday, as of 2014, domestic violence accounted for almost 20% of Vermont's prison population. Over the last several years, people from across the political spectrum have voiced increasing concern about how many people are incarcerated in the United States. And that conversation is happening in the anti-domestic violence community as well. Some of us are pretty skeptical about what has actually been accomplished by prioritizing the criminal legal response. Some of us are concerned about the disproportionate impact of law enforcement interventions on marginalized communities. And this was not a surprise to us or would not have been a surprise to us had we listened to the women of color who, in the early battered women's movement, were saying criminalization is going to be a problem for our communities. 30 state domestic violence coalitions, including the Vermont Coalition, are now considering alternatives to criminalization. And some of us have begun to ask whether turning away from the criminal legal system might be necessary in order to, uh, to explore and to develop those alternatives. So that's big stuff. And it's useful, I think, to go back and look at the history a little bit and talk about how we got to this place where the criminal legal system is our primary response to intimate partner violence. For those of you who were there, take a nap for like three minutes, pick me back up then. Um, but for those of you who weren't, the modern story of criminalization really starts in the 1960s and 70s. It's actually interesting as, as just a little footnote. Historically, actually, there was a criminal legal response to intimate partner violence way back. Um, there was a lot of intervention by the criminal system. But by the 60s and 70s, that had really died down. By the 60s and 70s, uh, police were reluctant to intervene in what was seen as a private family matter. In many jurisdictions, police officers were trained not to make arrests in cases involving intimate partner violence. Instead, the training manuals of the time told police officers that what they were supposed to do was to tell the guy, and it was always a guy, and it was always a husband specifically at that time, to take a walk around the block and cool down. I know that sounds like urban myth, but the training manuals really contained that guidance for police officers. Arrests were rare, prosecution was even rarer, and incarceration for domestic violence was almost unheard of. So that's the backdrop against which we get this ratcheting up of the criminal legal response. Ensuring that the state treated domestic violence like any other crime was a cornerstone of the early anti-domestic violence movement. New criminal laws were not, strictly speaking, what was necessary to realize that goal, although some states did pass laws specifically about domestic violence. Those who, who were who, those who abused sorry, could be arrested and prosecuted under existing assault laws, for example. The real problem was the failure of police and prosecutors to enforce those laws. And so policies like mandatory arrest, where police are required to make an arrest whenever they have probable cause to do so um, in a domestic violence case, and something called no-drop prosecution, which empowered prosecutors to bring cases without the consent of or the voluntary participation of the person who's been subjected to abuse, were intended to replace discretion that was not being used in these cases with mandates, with mandatory action. And the idea was that by doing this, we would get some response from the criminal legal system, a response that we had had really no luck in getting before. And I want to say something, this is a bit of a departure, but we were just having this conversation, I think it's important to say. Um, I say we because this is me too, um, later than some of you all admit. Um, but you know, we were deeply engaged in this work we believed that it would work. We believed that it would be the best thing that we could do for the women that we were seeing. And so I recognized in a way that I didn't before that for many of us, this is very personal. And I hope that you won't hear this as a personal attack on choices that we as a movement made, but really take it as an opportunity to reflect on those choices and to critically examine whether they were good choices. And the fact that we as a movement did this with the best of intentions doesn't mean that we were always right. Um, so that's my little aside for just a moment. So back to the main talk. Um, with the influx of funds from the Violence Against Women Act in 1994, police and prosecutors in courts had powerful incentives to adopt pro-arrest and pro-prosecution policies. 
Vala uh, poured and continues to pour hundreds of millions of dollars, I know I'm repeating that, into training and development and support of the criminal legal response to intimate partner violence. By 2003, when George W. Bush stated that government has got a duty to treat domestic violence as a serious crime, as part of our duty, many of us in the anti-violence movement would have agreed, and the way that we saw that happening was through the criminal legal system. And criminalization does have the potential to benefit some people subjected to abuse. So understand that I understand there are good things about having taken this road. Police intervention can stop a violent incident in the moment, right? And that's incredibly important. That's our first response. Courts can issue criminal stay-away orders to prevent unwanted conduct, uh, contact between people subjected to abuse and their partners, both before and after prosecution. Successful prosecution can ensure that those who use violence enter better intervention programs as a condition of their sentences, which may lead to behavior change. Certainly that's the hope in those programs. Prosecution can send the message that people are serious about ending the abuse. Even the threat of prosecution can give a person subjected to abuse some leverage with their partner. The criminal legal system can provide resources, including victim witness advocates and crime victim compensation funds to people subjected to abuse. Incarceration and other forms of monitoring can provide a respite from abuse that can give a person peace of mind and the ability to implement short and long-term safety plans. And of course, criminalization serves an expressive function, sending the message that intimate partner violence will not be condoned by the state or its citizens. But there is a powerful critique of the criminalization of intimate partner violence that also needs to be considered. Criminalizing domestic violence is one example of the increasing tendency described by law professor Jonathan Simon to address social problems by governing through crime. In recent years, the United States political system has failed to allocate resources to pressing social problems like poverty and homelessness and mental illness. And rather than provide low-income communities with social services, the U.S. government has increasingly put resources instead into the criminal legal system using that system to address the consequences of these unresolved social problems. Incarceration, the activist Angela Davis has said, is like magic, making societal problems seem to disappear. But the criminal law is poorly suited to solving these kinds of bigger societal structural problems. Criminalization of intimate partner violence hurts people subjected to abuse. And I think that's the, the part of the claim that's often hardest for those of us in the advocacy community to hear. But it does, and it particularly hurts women. The adoption of pro and mandatory arrest policies has led to a significant increase in arrest rates. That's absolutely true. Guess who's getting arrested most often? Women. Um, rates of arrests of women, particularly women of color, and dual arrests where both parties are arrested have skyrocketed since the inception of mandatory arrest party policies. Sorry about that. If women were committing acts of violence, at higher rates than in the past, those policies might be justified. Maybe then we were just capturing behavior that we weren't capturing before. But what the social science research tells us is that women are not, in fact, committing intimate partner violence at higher rates, and that these, penal these policies are causing them to be penalized without justification. And the failure to cooperate with the criminal legal system can have disastrous consequences for people subjected to abuse. Women are subpoenaed to testify when they choose not to cooperate with prosecutors. In many jurisdictions, they are arrested if they fail to comply with the subpoenas. In some jurisdictions, they are jailed as a result of those arrests when they fail to appear. This despite language in the Violence Against Women Act that forbids jurisdictions receiving Violence Against Women Act funding to force women to participate in prosecution. One Georgia city has even begun fining women who choose not to participate in prosecution and threatening them with arrest if they can't pay the fines. Women are prosecuted for perjury when they change their stories. Um, you should have been, many of you may have seen the video that went viral this summer of the Florida judge who told a woman who said, I didn't come to the case because I was homeless and I was trying to hold everything together and I was extremely depressed, that she would now know what depression was as she put her in jail. This can't have been what we intended 
when the anti-violence movement championed these policies. Now, as I said, anti-violence advocates of color have warned us since the inception of this movement that over-reliance on the criminal legal system would harm people of color. They're right. There is some evidence that women of color are more likely to call police than other women, but that stems in part from the complete lack of other responses available to those women. And recent research suggests that calls to police from African American communities decline and stay depressed for some time in the wake of high profile incidents of police brutality against people of color. So in too many cities to count, including my own beloved city of Baltimore, excessive use of force by police may be making women more reluctant to seek help. And calling the police brings its own dangers. Arrest rates among women of color for domestic violence are higher in mandatory arrest jurisdictions. Women of color have negative, even abusive experiences for, with police when they call for assistance with domestic violence. Um, look at Insight Women of Color's work on this, uh, look at Andrea Ritchie's work on this. The stories that women of color tell about what happens to them when they call police are horrible and terrifying and make you, make you wonder why anyone ever engages that system at all. State intervention cannot guarantee safety for women of color so long as those women both fear and are actively harmed by state intervention. Criminalization of intimate partner violence has also spurred the exponential growth of men of color's rates of involvement with the criminal legal system. In a study of Milwaukee County, Wisconsin, for example, Men of color represent 24% of the population, but 66% of the defendants in domestic violence cases. So it's clear that criminalization has both benefits and drawbacks. And I want to take you back to that moment in 1984 when domestic violence was made a criminal justice problem and asked why. But why was it that people thought that intimate partner violence should be criminalized? Legal scholars have really grappled with the question of whether and under what conditions conduct should be made criminal. These theorists share four central concerns. They're kind of four things that they say must be present or that we must consider before we make something criminal. First, only those acts that have the potential to cause harm should be criminalized. Second, there has to be some reason to believe that criminalization is going to deter the harmful behavior. Third, criminalization must do more good than harm. And finally, criminalization should happen only when there is no less um, intrusive alternative for preventing the behavior. Uh, notably, all of these theorists accept on some level that the crime of assault, which is the basis of most domestic violence prosecutions, should be criminalized. But I think that notwithstanding that consensus, I would argue that the work of these theorists supports the case for decriminalizing domestic violence. So first, to justify the criminalization of domestic violence, the law has to be addressing or preventing a serious harm. That's a no-brainer, right? The law of assault clearly does that. While not every assault actually causes serious harm to the victim, the types of behavior that are covered by the assault law have the potential to do serious uh, damage. And whether they're prosecuted as misdemeanors or as felonies, Domestic violence assaults do, in fact, seriously harm some victims with, with injuries that range from bruising to broken bones to brain damage. So clearly we've met the first condition, right? There's certainly harm here. Now is when it starts to get a little more dicey. Deterrence, the belief that there is a relationship between criminalizing an act and a decreased likelihood that that act will be committed as a result of criminalization is central to these theories. But it's not enough to just say, we're criminalizing this because we want to deter the behavior. That's very easy to do. There has to be some reason to believe that the law actually does or will deter the targeted conduct. So does criminalization deter domestic violence? It's hard to say. There's not a single study that has found that the existence of laws criminalizing domestic violence deters that behavior. Here's what studies have found. That arrest can have some effect on recidivism that ranges from modest to non-existent, and that in some cases, arrest can actually exacerbate the risk of further violence. Studies on the deterrent effect of prosecution are similarly inconclusive. Now, there may be reasons why these studies are not finding a strong deterrent effect. 
Inconsistent enforcement of the law, even in jurisdictions that have mandatory arrest and no-drop prosecution, may be hampering these deterrent effects. And the way that we measure deterrence is problematic. Deterrence is generally measured through recidivism. And recidivism is generally measured through re-arrest. But because the criminal law defines domestic violence very narrowly, generally as physical violence and threats of physical violence, using re-arrest as a proxy for re-abuse may be capturing only a fraction of the violence that is happening in these families and miss things like psychological and emotional abuse entirely. Connected to abuse may not choose to report new offenses to police or prosecutors, particularly if their initial interactions with the criminal legal system were negative or the system was ineffective in stopping the violence. Jurisdictions that aggressively enforce domestic violence laws, recidivism rates may be actually fairly high because criminalization fails to deter the hardcore offenders. And the hardcore offenders are a group that I want to return to a little bit later. <coughs> The third consideration uh, is whether criminalization of the act action does more good than harm. So that's really a cost-benefit analysis. So let's talk first about the costs. There are costs of criminalization generally, and then there are specific costs associated with incarceration. Criminalization generally being labeled as a criminal brings a social stigma and a host of restrictions on things like voting, eligibility for public housing and other kinds of benefits, education grants, and access to employment. And for undocumented people, conviction of a crime can mean deportation. Incarceration makes the cost of criminalization exponentially higher, though. Not only does incarceration not deter future violence, and this is pretty generally accepted among criminal crim criminalologists. That's good. good. <laughs> articulate. You like that, Bobby? Articulate. Um, articulate. <laughs> among criminologists. But time in prison may actually drive further offending creates and reinforces conditions that lead to greater recidivism. Inmates, decreased employment opportunities, destruction of communities, and something I'd like to call and other people have called toxic masculinity. So first, penal facilities in the United States are dehumanizing institutions. I don't think there's any kind of debate about that really. They use forms of punishment and control that have been rejected by most developed nations. Uh, Jonathan Simon refers to these facilities as waste management prisons. Such facilities are not intended to transform prisoners in any way. We have given up entirely on the idea of rehabilitation. They're only meant to warehouse criminal offenders. This treatment makes it difficult for prisoners to value others or to develop empathy, which are necessary preconditions to preventing further harm once they are released. Offenders report that prison creates an atmosphere where they can ignore or repress the effects of their actions on others again, making further violence more likely. Incarceration creates substantial barriers to employment. Prior to being jailed, two-thirds of male inmates are employed. Half of them serve as the primary source of support for their families. The children of incarcerated fathers are more likely to experience homelessness. Their mothers are more likely to receive public assistance. Upon release, formerly imprisoned men both work less and earn less. Having been incarcerated creates a significant impediment to finding employment for white men and a nearly insurmountable barrier for men of color. Incarceration depresses the wages and annual income of former inmates. And here's why this matters. So in theory, one could say, too bad. You did the crime, that's what you get. But here's why it matters for us. Rates of domestic violence correlate with male under and unemployment. The more often a man is unemployed, the higher the rate of violence. And there's a strong relationship between both subjective reports and objective measures of economic strain and intimate violence against women. Incarceration is creating conditions within which domestic violence flourishes. Incarceration also damages community resilience. Former inmates are frequently released into communities whose stability is challenged by the loss of significant numbers of their members to prison. In communities that are already challenged by poverty and high unemployment rates, social networks are really essential in providing support to families. Of significant numbers of people who should be raising children and contributing to the local economy undermines community strength. In addition, when members of communities know less about each other, their capacity for understanding each other's behavior decreases. 
And given that lack of familiarity, the community is less able to address conflicts as they occur. In such communities, informal social controls are undermined, which creates conditions that are ripe for violence, including intimate partner violence. Rates of domestic violence are much higher in economically disadvantaged communities, which may be a function of that loss of social controls and the weakening of social ties within those communities that is in part a, a result of incarceration. I think most importantly, though, is how the violence that offenders experience in prison gets recycled into their interpersonal relationships. And this is the, the idea of toxic masculinity that I mentioned. So the irony of incarceration is that you take individuals who are being punished for violence and send them to places where they are likely to be either perpetrators of or victims of or witnesses to more violence. 10 to 20% of prisoners report being physically abused in prison. 10% of state prisoners report being sexually abused. And the trauma of victimization has really serious consequences, including post-traumatic stress disorder and other mental health issues. Witnessing violence can trigger those same symptoms of trauma. So former prisoners then take this trauma out into their communities and into the relationships in their communities. And not surprisingly, things like post-traumatic stress disorder highly correlate with intimate partner violence. So the things that are happening within the prison are then replicated in the community in really destructive ways. Prisons also report, reinforce and magnify some of the destructive ideologies that drive intimate partner violence. Prison culture reflects the values and the norms of the outside society, including our norms around constructions of masculinity. Violence against women or people who are perceived as feminine is a way of reinforcing masculine identity. Prisoners bring these problematic notions of masculinity into the prison, have experiences inside of the prison that further shape and warp and reproduce those same kinds of norms, and then return to those communities with those ideas, a process that the law professor spirit has called the cycle of destructive masculinity. Those notions of masculinity in turn color the relationships that former, former prisoners have on the outside. So those are the costs. Weighed again, that's probably not all of them. You could probably think of more. Those are my costs. Weighed against these costs are the actual and potential benefits of criminalization. We talked about some of them earlier. In addition to those, criminalization brought huge resources to the anti-violence movement. Those resources didn't just go to courts and cops and prosecutors. They went to us. They went to non-governmental agencies who were encouraged by the Violence Against Women Act to partner with courts and cops and prosecutors to work on bringing these criminal legal reforms into our system in a way that was meant to be attentive to the needs of victims. Um, and so we were encouraged to partner with law enforcement to develop and maintain the criminal legal response. That was a benefit to our community, and I think it's hard at this point for people to think about turning away from some of that money, just to be honest. Criminalization could increase safety for people subjected to abuse, assuming that arrest incapacitates their partners, that prosecution leads to conviction, and that conviction results in incarceration, or the criminal court issues an order for the offender to stay away from the victim of the crime. People subjected to abuse report that punishments like jail time and probation give them the opportunity to put short and long-term safety plans into place, as I said. And regardless of the sentence imposed, some people uh, report experiencing less fear after their partners are convicted. Criminalization might deter future violence. I think we've talked about why that's an open question still. Uh, criminal laws forbidding intimate partner violence validate the experiences of people subjected to abuse by clearly and unequivocally stating that what has been done to them is wrong and that society condemns those actions. Moving away from criminalization could be seen as a tacit acceptance of intimate partner violence and a diminished state commitment to people subjected to abuse. And I think that's probably why we got some of the reaction to the title of this talk that we did. Even with these potential and actual benefits, though, I would argue that on balance, criminalization does more harm than good. Finally, before enacting criminal laws, we should consider alternatives to criminalization. Now, in the intimate partner violence context, alternatives to the criminal legal system certainly exist. We have protective orders, we have shelters, we have counseling, we have abuser intervention programs that don't require you to go through the criminal justice system, and most of those resources exist in many of our communities. 
But in terms of another way of intervening to control violent behavior, underdeveloped and under-theorized, um, policymakers and anti-violence advocates have been reluctant to explore programs designed to replace state intervention through the criminal legal system with other forms of control, citing to the, the kind of the, the two buzzwords of the battered women's movement, right? safety and accountability. And having worked for 40 years to have domestic violence treated as a crime, some advocates are unwilling to risk what they see as hard-fought gains by creating parallel or alternative forms of justice. But recent research suggests that victims of crime are more interested in accountability through rehabilitation than through incarceration. And models for delivering justice and addressing harm outside of the criminal legal system do exist. Restorative justice, for example, focuses on harms rather than crimes, allowing victims to define the harms that are done to them, requiring offenders to acknowledge the harm, and bringing victims, offenders, and their supporters together to craft a plan that holds offenders accountable for the harm and provides some reparation to the victim. Restorative processes give victims the opportunity to confront their perpetrators directly and to speak to them openly about how they have been affected by their behavior, a much more direct form of accountability than is available through the criminal legal system, where victim stories are mediated by due process concerns and the rules of evidence. Justice engages community members in supporting people subjected to abuse and in developing solutions that hold perpetrators accountable, making intimate partner violence more visible within the community. Studies have found that uh, people subjected to abuse have positive experience with restorative justice and would recommend those services to others. Among those studies are the studies done by Gail Burford that are still, I think sadly, some of the only studies that we have to rely on um, in doing this work. And so part of what we need to be doing is in these kinds of problem, programs so that we can provide this kind of information. Offenders accountable in community is another alternative to criminalization. Community-based transformative justice work with people subjected to abuse to determine what they need and to enlist community members to confront and respond to the violence exists in a couple of places in the United States. So I know that sounds kind of abstract. Here's an example of how they work. So there's a woman subjected to abuse. She's married to a police officer. But she cannot turn to the criminal legal system for assistance a number of her friends and supporters to help her brainstorm options after her partner's verbal abuse and stalking make her feel unsafe. Her friends help her to identify her goals. Her biggest goal is to feel safe in her home. And so they think about ways to do that. Her friends then set up a schedule to ensure that she was never home alone, which helped to restore her feeling of safety. They identified people who could talk to her partner in an attempt to try to calm him down to ease the situation. Her mother took on that role so that she always had someone to call for assistance. The group approached the abuse as a community rather than an individual problem. They asked, how are we going to make sure that there's not harm happening in our community? And they took care of it in that way. So this is someone who was never going to go to the criminal legal system. Like many partners of police officers, that system simply looks unavailable. And so we can look at these experiences and think about, are there ways to bring community back into the process of accountability, back into the process of safety for those folks who are never going to engage with the state for whatever reason? Of course, there are challenges to developing meaningful and effective community-based alternatives. Resources are always scarce for this kind of work. Community-based options are not going to appeal to everybody who's been subjected to abuse, particularly if what they want is punishment. Um, and, for, and punishment through the criminal justice system. <clears throat> Given the fragmentation and lack of connection between, within communities that I've already talked about, one could question whether a sufficient community structure even exists to support such programs, and whether communities will in fact hold abusers accountable for their actions. And one of our goals in the early battered women's movement was to change norms around intimate partner violence. I think they've changed some, but they haven't changed as much as one would have hoped, and we can see that when we look at the, the comments that happen whenever, say, a high-profile athlete abuses his partner and the victim blaming that goes on there. Um, and so I think it's a fair question to ask, do we really have strong enough community norms to make this kind of work happen? But there is some research to suggest 
that when communities believe in their capacity to organize and execute concrete actions to reduce intimate partner violence, this is a concept known as collective efficacy, the risk of male intimate partner violence decreases. Putting the work in. This could address the underlying causes of intimate partner violence. So economic interventions could address the link between male under and unemployment and domestic violence. Public health initiatives could develop prevention programs that target some of the root causes of intimate partner violence. We could be talking about toxic masculinity. We could be helping our boys to understand that being a man doesn't mean using violence or feeling entitled to use violence. But criminalization hampers the development, implementation, and evaluation of these types of programs. It's a safe harbor for policymakers and anti-violence advocates who fear replacing the known quantity of the criminal legal system with untested, <laughs> unproven alternatives. So long as funding for anti-domestic violence efforts remains targeted at the criminal legal system, criminalization will rob these efforts of the opportunity to develop alternatives. So on balance, I would argue that there is a credible and even a strong theory-based case to be made for decriminalizing domestic violence. Here's where the question mark comes in. But complete decriminalization is unlikely, and it's probably unwise. Realistically, neither policymakers nor most anti-violence advocates are ready to turn away from the criminal legal system. Repealing domestic violence statutes could send a problematic message about society's commitment to eradicating intimate partner violence, regardless of the effectiveness of those statutes. Arrest and prosecution play an important role in securing safety for some people subjected to abuse. And even those of us who are most concerned about the harms of criminalization know people who belong in jail. Thinking about my clients, I can think of two right off the top of my head without even trying hard, right? So there's some line that we've got to find between those folks who can be helped in community and helped in other ways and those folks who legitimately belong in jail. So instead of decriminalizing, I think we could think about two aspects of our current legal response. First, we need to get rid of policies that are harming those who they were meant to protect. Mandatory policies have been controversial among, and when I say mandatory policies, I mean mandatory arrest and no drug prosecution. Those policies have been controversial among anti-violence advocates since the first mandatory arrest law was adopted in 1977. Our experience since then has shown that mandatory arrest and prosecution policies are responsible for a significant portion of the harm done to women subjected to abuse when they become involved with the criminal legal system. Women are arrested more often. People are forced to testify against their will. They are punished for failing to testify. Mandatory <laughs> policies deprive people subjected to abuse of the power to choose how to deal with the violence in their lives. Criminalizing domestic violence does not require mandatory policies. We should get rid of them. Thank you, Bobby. <laughs> Second, we should rethink punishment. So rather than viewing punishment for domestic violence as a binary, right? A prisoner is either found guilty and incarcerated or not. Criminalization and punishment as a spectrum with a range of possible responses. The research on desistance, that desistance, by the way, means stopping. I didn't know that the first time I read it, so I thought it'd be helpful. Um, the research on desistance from domestic violence suggests that some perpetrators recognize the need to change, and they are willing to change their behavior. They want to stop using violence. They really do. Um, that process of change involves the interaction between an external structural factor, a negative consequence of using violence, and an internal negative emotional response to that consequence. Something bad happens when I do this. I don't want that something bad to happen to me. I will stop. And while that trigger could be intervention by the criminal legal system, it could also be community intervention. Now, there's a reason that public shaming works in some places. Um, and I've seen you know, advocates do this kind of work, where calling somebody out is enough to get the behavior to stop. Um, perpetrators are more likely to maintain that change when they have support and encouragement from family and friends and partners. The kind of networks that we can create through restorative and community accountability practices. The anti-violence movement should partner with community activists to conceptualize, pilot, and evaluate, most importantly, community-based alternatives to incarceration. 
The criminal legal system should be reserved for habitual and serious offenders, allowing us to focus resources where they are most needed. Studies have found that serial offenders are responsible for a substantial amount of intimate partner violence. So focusing on habitual offenders prevents those who otherwise might not repeat their violence from suffering the collateral consequences of criminal intervention and the effects of, of spending time in prison and concentrates our efforts around those who are doing the most harm. It makes sense to focus on the people who are creating the problem. We should also work to improve prison conditions in the United States. The conditions in US prisons are horrific. Overcrowding is the norm. Violence is rampant. Programming and treatment are scarce. It doesn't have to be this way. In Germany and in Norway, prisons are open. They allow offenders to work, to cook, to engage in human activities, all within the prison walls. Prisons uh, help offenders to find housing and employment and provide access to a support network upon release. And there are places in the United States that are embracing this philosophy. So in Atta County, Iowa, for example, correctional officers treat prisoners with empathy and respect. That shouldn't be unusual, but it is. Uh, they maintain an open door policy, encouraging inmates to come and talk to them about the problems that they're experiencing. The punishment of incarceration should be losing your freedom, not your dignity, and not your safety. There are some offenders who are so dangerous that they need to be incapacitated, but the conditions of confinement shouldn't increase the likelihood that they will use violence when they are released. We as a movement need to partner with other social justice movements that are doing this work. Their work is our work. We also need to ensure that measures intended to protect prisoners from violence are being enforced. So the Prison Rape Elimination Act, for example, is designed to protect prisoners from rape or sexual assault by guards or other inmates during incarceration. National commissions have documented preventative measures that prisons could take, consistent with PREA's mandate to eliminate violence. Nonetheless, rates of sexual violence remain ridiculously high in many prisons and jails. Part of that movement, and we haven't been. So in a very bizarre legislative maneuver around PREA, um, one of the justifications for taking the teeth out of PREA was that in doing so, we would somehow deprive the domestic violence movement of funding. It's way too Byzantine for me to explain. You can probably explain it. Um, but the point is, we didn't, as a movement then, stand up and say, don't use us as the justification for gutting PREA. That's not a good reason. When we're allied with other movements, then we're making that clear that we won't be used as the justification for allowing sexual violence to continue to be rampant in prisons. 907,000 incidents of intimate partner violence were reported in the United States in 2010. Arresting, trying, convicting, and incarcerating each participant, each perpetrator of those incidents would substantially increase the already overwhelming number of inmates in US prisons and jails. The United States is not going to arrest and prosecute its way out of its problem with intimate partner violence. As Ann Sparks asked in 1997, how many prisons are we willing to build for battles? We can't use prison to disappear intimate partner violence. And we're not going to make a serious dent in mass incarceration without addressing violent offenders. Experts agree that focusing efforts around low-level drug offenders won't significantly decrease the prison <laughs> population. We have to deal with a large number of offenders who are in prison for violent crimes. Looking at alternatives to incarceration in cases of intimate partner violence could give us an entry point into that conversation. So the US policy experiment with criminalization is the primary response to intimate partner violence is neither an unqualified success nor a total failure. What it has revealed is the need for a more graduated response to intimate partner violence and a response that does not harm those people that it was intended to protect. The next phase of the anti-domestic violence movement should be dedicated to developing, implementing, and evaluating that alternate response. Um, so I told Bonnie I was happy to facilitate questions myself if people have questions. There's a microphone, so... I have a question. Sure. No, Sarah, there's a microphone they want you to use. I think it has to do with the video. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs>
Good to know. Thanks. Thank you, Lee. <laughs> You're being taped here. Yeah, thank you. Noted. Uh, thanks, Lee, for your comments. And um, I found them really valuable and, and very validating for the work that we're trying to do here in Vermont. I have to admit that I was one of those advocates. I was hired in 1995. You know, and I was given a guidebook on how uh, we do this work and why we do this work and why uh, it's important that we stay doing, uh, sit, follow those rules really carefully. And it was really grounded in the idea of safety. And we were given the phrase, someone will die if we don't do this. We found over time, of course, someone will die even if we do, I well, think is part we, of the response. Right. We too. found yeah, over time, you know, that people continue to die. Vermont has one of the highest per capita domestic violence homicide rates in the country in 2010, we were number two only to Texas, second only to Texas. So we know that the millions of dollars that we've spent over this last, these last 30 years has, has been effective in some ways, but in other ways has really missed the boat. We're so fortunate in Vermont to have be represented by Senator Patrick Leahy, who's one of the primary co-sponsors of the Violence Against Women Act. And you know, he's a guy who can who he's a he's a former prosecutor, he's a law enforcement guy, but he's and I just want to acknowledge that Diane Derby is sitting right here. Um, but I would be saying this if you if you weren't Diane. Um, <laughs> Senator Leahy is able to hold uh, he's able to hold both realities, both truths, that there is a criminal legal response and that there's a federal law that that creates this response and that it's important that the law change over time to respond to the, the realities of survivors, especially survivors from marginalized communities. And so I really appreciate your comments about the fact that all those years ago, we did not listen to women of color. And, and I was one of those non-listeners. I was one of those people that truly believed that if we built a system that everybody would be able to access it. Uh, and I was really wrong about that. So, um, so my I'm getting to a question. My question for you, thank you for entertaining my little lecture, um, and self-disclosure. The, the question I have for you is about the Violence Against Women Act, which sits as this, you know, this, this hallmark kind of basic federal law that we rely on. It's a formula, the stop, the stop part of that, grant, that uh, law is a formula that comes out to states and two thirds of that funding goes to the criminal legal system, one third comes to victim services. Studies have shown over the years that exactly the inverse is true in terms of the numbers of victims at, uh, accessing criminal legal and accessing services. So my question is, do you see any hope for um, amending that law to respond to what we now understand, the way we, we really think that we have to go to uh, address these issues in our communities, or do you think that we, that we got to scrap it. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm not advocating scrapping the Violence Against Women Act. <laughs> that would be among the most controversial things I would have ever said if I were to say it. I will not say that. Um, and I actually think there is an interesting movement going on around rethinking the priorities of the Violence Against Women Act and thinking about how you shift funds in more productive ways. Um, and so I was just part of a conference on the grand challenges in social work where one of the things we advocated for was to basically do that shift that you talked about, which was to put lots more money into the social service and direct service portions of VAWA and less into the criminal justice response. I think what's possible, um, I think particularly it's possible if the advocacy community will come together around it. And now that we have this movement among the state coalitions, I think that's you know, part of that response. Um, but it's hard, right, because the people who really have impact on VAWA are the national organizations and not so much the grassroots people. Um, so we've got to get to them, right, and be in their ear about what the new priorities need to be and how we shift them. But it, even, you know, the big national organizations know this too. When the National Network to End Domestic Violence does its annual snapshot of domestic violence in the United States, routinely what they find is that the single biggest need is for housing, right? Always it's housing. Always, always, always. Um, and so it's not that the nationals don't know this. I think shifting Congress is harder because so many folks either from a perspective, our former prosecutors or were involved in that system in some way, or don't want to be seen as soft on crime. And so what we need to think about is how we sh message, I hate that, that's not a verb, how we describe what we're doing in ways that don't make people look soft on crime but really say, hey, you know what, courts, cops, and prosecutors, they've got 40 years worth of funding, and they've done things with it. And now maybe <laughs> we should try something different um, and try to meet some of these other unmet needs. 
think the other cool thing that's happening, and Gail's part of it and knows much more about it than I do, is it okay for me to talk about that, you think, yeah? So the Office on Violence Against Women is starting to look at some of these alternatives, like restorative justice, and at least start to put some of the groundwork in place to help us think about how we can do alternative justice kinds of work. Um, the Office on Violence Against Women sponsored a forum on mandatory arrest that was pretty critical of mandatory arrest. So I think that working through OBW is another vehicle, and I think they're really starting to move in some ways, too. No, we're not getting rid of Bala. No, no. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Good evening. Thank you for your remarks. I'm one of the several prosecutors here tonight in Vermont, and uh, you gave an example of a sort of uh, process which encompassed really a bunch of people coming together. And I think from my experience in Washington County, at least most of our cases of domestic violence have one of several factors in them, uh, either poverty, underemployment, alcohol, or opiate or other drug addiction. So some of what was described in terms of access and ability to participate in the restorative process would be limited. So how do you apply that model to those groups that are at risk or can't necessarily participate? So I actually think that let's if we tease some of those things apart, um, I think people who are in poverty can absolutely participate if we adequately fund restorative justice programs. Um, I think that people who are underemployed should be participating because those restorative justice is actually ideally suited to bring together a community of supporters, one of whom can say, hey, I've got work. You know, you can come work for me and you can do this work and that might help. Um, that might get at this issue, right? Building a community of support then gives people access to resources that they're not getting if they're just being shoveled through the criminal legal system. I think the piece about opiates is harder, of course, right? But um, I think not impossible. And the, the key, I think, to developing these restorative justice alternatives is to ensure that people with expertise in domestic violence are sitting at the table when they are developed, are part of the screening, are part of the facilitation so that they're there to recognize things that are happening within that room, to point them out, to be, to have done all the groundwork that's necessary. Let me throw in just a big caveat about restorative justice. It's not going to work for everybody. Um, it's not, it cannot replace the criminal legal system. There's no way that it can do that for a couple of different reasons. One is it's very labor intensive. Two is it takes resources. Three is a offender has to accept responsibility before they engage in the process. And for me, I said this two years ago, I'll say it again, that is the bedrock principle that I would not ever get away from if I started doing this work in domestic violence cases. So some of those guys are never going to get there. They're not going to accept responsibility or the, the work isn't going to be available to do. So it's important to know that. Um, but I do think that the, in those communities that you're describing, there's a substantial amount of possibility if you can bring community resources to bear on some of those things that are really the underlying causes of the violence. Um, or at least related to, significantly related to, or correlated with the violence. Um, is, that, is that satisfying? It is. It's a good answer, I think, on the victim end. But again, some of those things we've talked about are going to be offender issues, absent incarceration, or prohibitive conditions. Yeah. How do you get them to address the alcoholism that fuels yeah. violence in a household? So I think some folks are willing to address it, right? Um, and they're looking for resources to help them. Some folks have never had anyone call them on it. Um, and having that community come in and say, you know what, you're, you're, when you drink, you are violent. And I'd like to stay in this relationship with you, or I don't want to. I'd like to co-parent with you, or I'd like you to be safe for our children, and whatever that looks like. But we can't do that unless you're willing to put these steps into place. And then you turn to the community of support and you say, how do you, community, how are you going to help this guy put these steps into place? Well, I know where the 12-step program is. I'll drive him there every time. Um, I'll be the one who he can call whenever he wants to take a drink. I'll be the one who she can call when he's been drinking and she needs him to get out of the house. Putting that, those kinds of things into place, that's what I talked about in terms of kind of the negative consequence coupled with um, the external, right? If you can create some understanding that what you're doing has a consequence, it harms the person that you say that you love or that you care about. It's actually kind of amazing when you read the restorative justice literature how little many offenders understood that conversations with their partners and with their communities of support and how much they say that they understand it afterwards. Um, again, Gail should be up here doing this part of this, but I really think that sometimes they don't see it at all. They haven't worked through it, and we don't have systems that help offenders to work through that stuff. We just have systems that say, 
you did wrong, and now we're going to warehouse you for this period of time. Oh, whoever's got the mic. I guess I don't have control anymore. You got a microphone. The mic. <laughs> okay, hi. Uh, I'm David Daniel. I'm the state's attorney for this county. And I'm, I'm going to do, unfortunately, one of the cruelest things that we can do to um, professors at law school is just to ask them a practical question. Um, so as Bobby said, I'm a practicing lawyer who is in has three trials next week um, and spends a lot of my time in the courtroom. So practical works. Okay. All right. So um, I just want to I want to put a local Vermont spin on some of the facts that were presented during the presentation and kind of give you my perspective of the lay of the land in Vermont and. Um, from my perspective, uh, you know, over the last 20 years, we could say that the DV reporting rate is up. The DV offense rate is also up as to whether there is correlation or causation hasn't really adic been adequately studied at the state level. Um, do we as a statewide policy have a mandatory arrest policy? No. Um, do we have a uniform policy of subpoenaing victims? No. Do most prosecutors do it? No. Um, will someone in this audience be able to point to an example of a bad apple who did that? Yes. Um, do uh, do any of these count? Do any of the counties in Vermont have a policy of seeking a, a criminal conviction for victims who fail to testify? No. Will uh, someone in this room be able to point out a bad apple that is a you know a story just the contrary? Probably yes. Um, do we pursue perjury prosecutions against victims? Generally, no. Is there a bad apple? Maybe. Um, do we have no drop policies around the state? Generally not. Um, so, and then the next point that's kind of Vermont specific is that right now, criminal justice reform and restorative justice in particular are trendy. It's, it's a popular topic to discuss. Um, in Vermont, restorative justice has been the official policy of the state, as in it's written in literally the first section in our title that has to do with punishment. Title 28 of Vermont statutes, the first substantive section says, restorative justice is the official policy of the state of Vermont. Here are ways to implement it. That was put into law in the year 2000. It's been the law for the last 16 years. I think most of the people in the room, including most of the prosecutors in the room, all agree that prison is not a particularly useful tool for rehabilitation, right? It causes human suffering. Some people may believe that that suffering is a proportional response to suffering that occurred outside the prison walls. Some may disagree with that. Um, but recognizing that that is the landscape in Vermont, that we pretty much are on the same page with you, maybe not for some of the reasons that you've articulated, but for whatever reason we haven't fully gotten there. What advice would you give to a state that has an official policy of restorative justice for the last 16 years? Um, Jim Kenyon has written that 20% of our prison population nonetheless is in for some sort of domestic crime. Um, the initial response is some form of probation, usually with the batterers intervention program. Where do we go next? What should we be doing? So I think there, so first of all, um, yay for you, um, because you know, half of what I would tell you to do, you've already done, so great, get rid of your bad apples, you don't have a problem with mandatory policies. Um, in a, in a talk of this length, it's hard to get into all of the complexity of some of this, but um, John Braithwaite and Kathy Daly back in 1994 described kind of a system of intervention um, in cases of intimate partner violence that they, it's a pyramid, right? And at the bottom of the pyramid is on a first offense, maybe we have a community intervention of some kind, right? We do the kind of community accountability work that I talked about that I don't think is necessarily happening in Vermont. Karen, help me out here. It's um, true, we have state law that precludes that. precludes that from happening, right? Okay, so there, there's one thing we could do. Um, but so there's a kind of a community intervention, and there are interesting kinds of interventions that are happening in various places. Um, high Point, North Carolina, I think, is a great example where they have police going to really high-risk offenders and saying, look, now we're watching you. Um, and 
we're not prosecuting this case. We got this complaint. It's not being prosecuted. You are on our radar. We know that this is something that we need to be worried about, and you can either you know, keep going with this or you can stop, right? So people knowing that there are eyes on them makes a difference. I think we can work in community to try to build these kinds of accountability systems. And then you work your way up the pyramid. You work on restorative justice. Now, restorative justice may be the official law, but I would venture a guess as to say that it's not being done in domestic violence cases because people are completely freaked out by the notion of doing it in domestic violence cases. And one of the things we need to really work on is implementation of that. That takes money, that takes thought, that takes creative people who are willing to say, effort into trying to figure out how we can do this in a way that is safe for people subjected to abuse, that gives meaningful accountability, right, that gives those terms some substance, and not to say it's the law. We make lots of things the law, it doesn't mean they happen, right, and I would, I would be willing to guess that restorative justice on any kind of regular basis is not happening, notwithstanding 16 years of law. Um, I think that for us in the movement, there are other kinds of social justice movements that we should be engaged with. So we need to make communities comfortable with the idea of law enforcement. And that might not be as big a deal here in Vermont as it is, say, in Baltimore, where I live. But I think that one of the things that we can be doing is thinking differently about how we engage law enforcement. Um, I do think that incarceration should be our last resort. And probation can't become some kind of cheap substitute for incarceration, right? Because that's, it's not, it doesn't dignify people anymore. It creates a lot of the same problems. And quite frankly, rates of probation violation are high, as high as they are, criminologists, I gotta stop saying that word, um, the experts suggest, not because people substantively violate the criminal law again, but because they violate all the stupid rules that they got to follow while they're on probation. They fail to pay their fines, they fail to show up for their meetings, they fail to be drug tested regularly. So there's some evidence out there that suggests that probation can be used meaningfully if we stop focusing on these kind of the smaller violations and actually focus on people's behavior. That's another thing I would suggest might be useful is a meaningful kind of probation. Most people who are uh, arrested for and convicted of domestic violence aren't on any kind of meaningful probation. Departments can't do it. Um, they're not staffed sufficiently. They can't have the kind of ongoing monitoring that's really necessary to ensure that that's happening. So I think that's another thing. Um, I think the movement work that I talked about is absolutely something that we can all be doing. And I think, you know, the last thing I would say is that I have some ideas, but I am really aware that I don't have all the ideas. And I think part of the reason for having this conversation is to surface these issues so that we can start to have conversations across professions about what those alternatives might be and how we can do this work better. We're not having those conversations now because we're so mired in criminalization. Okay, I'm told you, you get two more short questions. So I guess no more speeches, just questions for me too. Um, they have to end with a question mark. Yeah, I, I don't know where the mics are. Oh. Uh, hi, my name is Scott Woodward. Uh, I'm a candidate for the state senate this year, and this is a very helpful uh, lecture, so thank you. Um, you. You got my attention on community intervention. And so a question is, do you see this in the broader collection of social ills that we're trying to address? Not just domestic violence, but poverty, opiate crisis, you know, the whole range of social ills. It seems as if the way we administer programs tend to depersonalize or isolate people uh, because it, it just is an observation of mine that it feels like individuals become isolated. Yeah. And, and the way you describe community intervention pulls people together. And I wonder if you, you see this as not just part of uh, uh, intimate partner violence, but also the broader community intervention across an array of social ills that we need to kind of tackle. So I'm not gonna come, I'm not gonna claim any expertise across an array of social ills, and I've looked at this really in the context of domestic violence. Intuitively, I wanna say yes, right? That engaging community is a great thing. Um, the critique that I often get is a very academic one, and it has to do with something called neoliberalism. Um, and the idea that we should privatize services and re require people to kind of bootstrap themselves and make churches and others responsible for all this stuff. I want to be very clear that that's not what I'm saying. 
I think the state has a responsibility to do this work. It's how it does the work that matters. And some of that work can get done not by just saying to people, communities, you're on your own, but actually putting resources into communities that allow them to do that work. You justice reinvestment was supposed to be about taking the money that was being spent on prisons and putting that money back into communities. That's not what's happening with justice reinvestment money. They think if it were, it could get at some of those other problems that you're talking about as well. I'm told one more question. You've got the mic. Hi, <laughs> ah, thanks for coming. Um, let's say you were to decriminalize domestic violence. How would that look in a statute? Because most you said that most of these are uh, uh, prosecuted by uh, assault statutes. You just have your typical assault statutes and then exempts intimate partners. How would that work? And to kind of to kind of inflame the uh, the, the, uh, the the question, how do you write a statute that will punish me if I punch a random person in the face? It won't if I punch my wife. So there's a huge equal protection problem there. Um, yeah, I you asked actually the hardest question. Um, which is how can you actually go about doing this? There's an enormous equal protection problem with the idea that we will only punish certain kinds of crimes but not other kinds of crimes. Um, and the answer to that, you know, honestly, is I'm not sure. And that's part of the reason why I come out at, at the place where I do, which is that we probably can't do this, um, in part because the implementation is really, really hard to figure out. But I think we can do graduated punishment. So I wouldn't redo the assault statutes, but I would redo the ways that we approach punishment. But you, you hit the single hardest question right on the head. Um, equal protection doesn't allow us to prosecute crimes against strangers, but not crimes against intimates. And so that's a huge problem. Can we do a second last question? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm here for you. So my question has to do with, again, going back to context and how we might apply your work in Vermont. Um, we still have to keep the wings on the airplane here, right? So I think all of us in this room are probably here because we believe that domestic violence is wrong and that, and we want to stop it in our communities, right? And so we have a system that has criminalized domestic violence and, and we provide a whole array of other services here and Dave Cahill pointed that out too, it's true. How do we work with state legislators, with our, you know, with Congress, where people aren't, Congress isn't known for nuance, right? right. <laughs> and for understanding complicated ideas like the ideas we're talking about today. How do we, how do we apply this work and this concept without running the risk of telling legislators who aren't used to nuance, like, that, oh yeah, we're done with domestic violence and right. here's a great way to cut your prison population. Yeah, and so I think that, you know, part of that is about pilots. Pilot projects are wonderful ways to try new things without abandoning the old, to get some good data around what works and what doesn't, and then to make a case for expansion. And so, you know, one of the things I would love to see happen is for funds in the Violence Against Women Act to be made available to do pilot programs around restorative justice. That's something a bunch of us have been advocating around, right? Because you're right, we can't ditch one thing and say, okay, we're gonna ditch the one thing we have that is doing something, whatever it might be doing. Boy, and what are we supposed to do with it? And by the way, it doesn't mean this problem has been solved, right? You're absolutely right. So um, I wanna, I'm gonna paraphrase Gloria Stein and I'm gonna do it badly, but we have to fix the bicycle while we're riding it, basically. Right? We have to start figuring out different ways to do things without completely abandoning what we've got. And in part, I think we're never going to completely abandon what we got because there are some people who need to be in jail. But we need to start doing the hard work amongst ourselves before we engage legislators, before we engage others, so that we can set the terms of this debate to say, we thought through what a graduated punishment scheme might look like. We thought through what the conditions are under which somebody should be incarcerated versus some kind of community engagement. We thought about what that community engagement might look like. We know what the resources are that we need, and we'd like to try it out. I think that's the point at which you can go to legislators and say, we just want to try it. Let us pilot it. Let us see what happens, and then we can expand it. I'm not. This is not an overnight solution, right? And I, I don't have any belief that it is. Um, and I don't think, by the way, that, you know, the U.S. problem with mass incarceration is about a million different things, none of which anybody actually has really been able to define yet. One of those things is domestic violence. 
And we can play with, try to make improvements upon, think critically and carefully about how we do our work and try to have that have a larger impact. But it starts small, it starts with data. I think the, the single most important thing that we can do is evaluate. That if we create these problem, pro problems, we create this program, so I'm getting really tired, and we evaluate them, then we have tools that we can take beyond just this system sucks, it doesn't work for my clients, and we need to do something different. So, let me steal the mic. Absolutely. Um, so, can I say thank you? No. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, Lee did not ask for this to happen, but Barrister's Bookstore uh, arranged to have some copies of her book here. <laughs> she will be incredibly embarrassed, as she is right now, <laughs> to sign your book, but please do that. And, 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 now you can say thank you, and so can we. So um, I realize that these are challenging ideas. I can't tell you how much I appreciate the time that you put in with me. I appreciate your questions. I appreciate the hard work everybody in the room is doing, and I hope that we get to continue doing this work together. Thank you so much for coming.